impact of COVID-19. We all knew this was going to be a tough time. We need to wrap our minds around a painful truth. We're in the early stages of what is going to become a series of cascading crises. This is the way it's going to be. Getting back to uh, the extraordinarily successful country and economy that we've had, uh, that we built over so many generations. However long it takes. Welcome back to a new normal, Start Well series focusing on entrepreneurs and innovators living across Canada in post pandemic realities. For this, the fourth episode, I sat down with Ujwal Arkelgood to talk about how his company, MotiveBase, has been dealing with clients through the last few weeks of difficulty and uncertainty, as well as some trends that they're spotting through data. I'll start with a I'll start with a funny anecdote. I was uh, on a on a call with a senior execs at a major food company, and the food company is very excited right now because their their canned business, which was pretty flat, has shot through the roof, right? And they're getting all this short term data that says, oh yeah, you know, people have lost faith in fresh produce, fresh food, everybody's scared. And so their mindset is, this is going to carry forward. It may not be as bad, but this is the trend that's going to shape our future. So we need to reinvigorate our canned business, right? And, and um, you know, we're studying culture and and our, our focus is let's look beyond the obvious things that people are talking about right now. Because when human beings are constrained against their will, they're going to say stuff that is not in line with their own values, their own beliefs. And so when we look at it through a cultural lens, we actually see the opposite. Um, people are developing new knowledge about, for example, the value of health, in particular, the value of nutrition. People are developing new knowledge like mainstream audiences who did not know anything about immune health are now suddenly learning about immune health. Right. They're learning that their diet is, for example, deficient in B12 or in vitamin D or C. They're learning of the value of simple things like oranges and citrus fruits in their diet. So it's actually the opposite. They're behaving in a way that helps them survive right now, but the actual focus is on the opposite, which is... Once we come out of this, what do I need to do to be better prepared for the future, to have my family be better prepared for the future, and to change my habits for the better? Right. It's not going to be a complete 180, but the, the shifts we're seeing is actually counterintuitive. It's the opposite of what people are talking about right now. Uh, and you know, what I was trying to help them understand is that really what you, the way you have to think about this is the new knowledge it creates in the marketplace, this kind of cultural bomb that this, this pandemic is, it creates new knowledge in the marketplace. And the real question is how that new knowledge transfers into new behavior. Right. So it's a food, for example, it's the new knowledge of healthfulness or about immune health and the role of nutrition in it or the role of gut health in it. Uh, in the case of uh, finance, for example, it's new knowledge about the role of saving. And it's really interesting, like we're seeing younger consumers who are lucky enough to have their jobs right now um, get a renewed focus on saving, A, because of the realization of what this could be and the fact that you know people believe that this may not be the last one in our lifetimes. Uh, and the second one being that suddenly they find themselves with a handful of cash because their uh, expenses have gone down. They've, they've, you know, their, their travel plans are canceled. Their, uh, you know, all their expensive uh, discretionary expenses are gone, right? No more nice dinners out and all that stuff. No more nightclubs. No more nightclubs, no more daycare costs, like all the stuff that is expensive uh, is suddenly disappeared. And so people, are finding themselves with an extra two, three thousand dollars a month. Those of you know those people who are fortunate enough to have a continued income, and so it's reinvigorating a, a knowledge base about saving and the value of saving and what they could do with it. 
that's an interesting thing that's happening in finance. Again, counterintuitive. Everybody's so focused on the fact that the 15% unemployment will create a drop in disposable income. People are forgetting about the other side of the coin, the 75, 85% that have their jobs who have spent less for four months, five months, maybe eight months, who knows how long, uh, suddenly have a different idea of what to do. Um, do you think here in Canada, because of this, like, We've had this kind of looming question of transfer of wealth because of baby boomers retiring and passing right. down their money. Uh, do you think this like, you know, because older generation are being a little bit scared about health issues now uh, and they may have family members that are younger that are either furloughed or looking at like now, you know, wondering about their financial future. Are we going to see a massive transfer of wealth, you think, because of this? Um, I, I think so. Too. I mean, definitely to a certain extent. Uh, I think uh, the issue is more about, you know, how do I, um, if, if I can afford to give my kid a, um, a boost, how do I do that? But we're also seeing the flip side of it, which is a renewed interest, especially in uh, populations that have um, parents that are reliant on them. So parents, for example, like a lot of conversations are about kids suddenly realizing, hang on a minute, my, my parents are on a fixed income. Uh, in Canada, at least the health um, insurance question isn't there. Like right. The way it is in the right. US. It's not, it's not an expense that people have to it's worry. It's not an expense that people have to worry about. So that's a big deal. But uh, you still see discussions about fixed income. You see discussions about people feeling like, wow, I have dependents, which is not just my children, but also my parents who you know, if they do fall sick and need my help, uh, either A, my income is down or, you know, B, I can't even go help them. Uh, and, and I can't afford to hire help for them or what have you. So there's, there's definitely a renewed anxiety about that. And I think that's another area where we think, you know, post pandemic, there will be a renewed interest in, in saving for a multitude of reasons. One is this realization that you know, I need to think a little bit more about the future. I can't live paycheck to paycheck. And the second thing being, you know, those people, and I think this is especially true for, um, you know, immigrants who may have, you know, dependent parents, who may, they, they, they may have brought over to Canada and so on and so forth. And we definitely see a skew there uh, where there's a cons greater concern. Um, yeah, the, the other one that I think is, is you know, so related to your business, um, you know, like there's so much narrative right now about how people won't go back to work, right? Uh, oh, are people just going to want to work from home? Yeah, in the mainstream yeah. media and in, yeah. in, in like there's this narrative in, uh, yeah, in, in like kind of major newspapers is a reportage of people maybe trying to report from home and kind of saying, Oh, I'm still a reporter. I could still do this without, you know, hitting my beat. And then there's the people on the tech side saying, wow, video conferencing is blowing up. Maybe this is something. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, it's, it's a nut, it's the same example as food. It's counterintuitive. We're actually seeing the opposite. People are saying I'm frustrated as hell. I, I can't work from home. I can't see four walls all the time. I need to interact with human beings. Uh, I need to feel inspired. I need to be out and about. Uh, you know, my, I can't rely on inspiration being from watching YouTube videos or TED talks or, you know, I don't know, masterclass videos, <laughs> right? I, I have to interact with human beings. And, and um, you know, as much as um, the, the mainstream media is talking about how, I think that recently there was a report that they surveyed people and they said they think 30% less people will come back to work as in physically. Right. Uh, and again, I just, I don't believe it. It's the it, culturally, it's the opposite. There's a renewed realization of the value of personal relationships of the value. Oh, would well, you seem to disappear a little bit. Can you hear me? I can't hear or see you for a second here. Let's see. Let's see if you come back. Oh. We lost each other. I think we're back, right? Yeah. We're back. 
Okay. Yeah, that was weird because we were just, uh, you know, throwing stones on the future of video conferencing and then it all kind of dies there. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I mean, um, uh, I was just, I mean, ironically, uh, we're Zoom users, but uh, Zoom has been, has been difficult. Meanwhile, all my clients have switched to Microsoft Teams and it's been awesome. So oh, really? <laughs> hey? It. Yeah, it's been amazing using it. Uh, I mean, it's their accounts, but still, it's been like super smooth and, and very anti Microsoft. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just going to say again, culturally, we're not seeing that culturally. Um, uh, I, I think the part where uh, I, I, you lost me was I was just saying that will people demand more flexibility? Yes. But does it mean people don't want to come into work? No. Uh, I think there's a renewed interest in, in, the, in the value of professional and personal relationships. I agree, man. And it's something that I've been hearing um, as I've been staying in touch with a lot of our members and alumni that have either kind of like left before this COVID uh, bonanza or during in the last few weeks. And, um, you know, a lot of people kind of like have taken a bit longer maybe than us as operators of space to figure out kind of what the return to work looks like and even what the remote working picture looks like. Um, yeah. Personally, of course, coming from open source, I've been working on remote teams since, you know, for over 15 years. Um, so I've for many years battled with the issues of what it feels like mentally, emotionally to work from home, all the nuances to do with the difficulties of, of maintaining a lifestyle and a routine at home and the problems of connecting with people uh, when you don't want to look at them, you know, and you don't want to hear them, but you want to still communicate through body language and all these things. So, um, but the, all that to say that, yeah, I mean, I was, I was pretty early on. I wasn't afraid that this would uh, impact our business in the long run. In fact, I thought the opposite. Um, I think that you're right from what I see in the want for people to not only return to work to be together, but um, people are, I see it, of course, downtown Toronto. I'm seeing it every day. We see it out of the window here on King Street, just looking at the lineups at Shoppers Drug Mart across the road. Um, the restrictions people feel is incumbent upon them uh, because of societal expectations mandated by not just healthcare officials, but uh, politicians who normally would have no impact on people's day-to-day -day decisions. And I find this personally very interesting that uh, society is taking its cues in Canada and here in downtown Toronto from the very people that normally they wouldn't particularly listen to or would shun right. from their minds. And, um, and anyway, as that um, kind of new narrative in people's lives is, is causing them to accept what doesn't feel like reality, there's a friction there. And I think it's, there's all these lifestyle issues that are coming up to do with, you know, things like I mentioned to do with remote work and people obviously getting furloughed and trying to deal with uh, unemployment and cash flow issues and family issues. Um, but I think that's all compounded by politicians and the, the kind of like leadership in the country and uh, the province of the city, not particularly taking responsibility for people's lifestyle and, for expressing the issues to people, uh, raising stage of it on a national level, uh, to, to have Canadians question not just what a new normal looks like, but what are, what's an ideal lifestyle improvement that people want for themselves and how will they commit to it and be able to afford it uh, through this transition. So definitely we're working on some things, um, both in the healthcare industry uh, to look at the future of telemedicine and how it can be uh, like developing a co-working model for telemedicine uh, here on campus right now. And we have doctors doing telemedicine calls here um, to try and use this downtime to use the space for a different function, uh, yeah. document it, case study it and publish it through St. Michael's hospital and the, the health network here in Toronto and stuff. Um, so we'll be doing some, like we'll have some new purposes on campus after this but at the same time, some new products that will hopefully, you know, make it more affordable uh, and more easy to uh, commune in safe ways. And that's going to be a whole, it's hard to, to make sense of what, the, for me anyway, what the transition to uh, a safe proximity uh, measure is for people. 
I, I think it's yeah. doubtful that six feet apart, people will continue their lives for much longer. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, you know, there, there, whatever the changes um, that do come about, I think the interesting thing is that everything opens the door for something new. Uh, I'll give you an example. One of our clients in the U.S., um, an insurance provider, um, looked at this as an opportunity to uh, create and launch a new uh, flexible insurance plan uh, without going into too much detail about it. Uh, really, the purpose of it is the realization that maybe people will look at the relationship with their cars a little bit differently. So mm -hmm. we want to give them the greater flexibility to um, potentially turn insurance on and off um, with some restrictions, of course. But it has been met with, with an incredible response. They've had people switch their insurance from competitors during this time a, to get some short-term savings, but B, also because they see this as connecting with the value systems uh, of the consumer. It's a great example where, yeah, you know, they might make a little bit less money than they would per customer, but they gain so much more competitively as a result of it. Uh, but that's just a result of, uh, you know, really smart thinking and realizing that instead of, you know, kind of sitting and waiting for the new world to emerge, they're taking some risks and some chances now um, to figure it out. I mean, it's ne never perfect, but uh, I remember the, um, um, I remember watching an interview from the boss of uh, the guy who used to run Formula One racing uh, back mm -hmm. in the day, uh, Bernie Ecclestone. And I remember once he said, uh, the difference between me and uh, other organizations is that in our organization, uh, I sort of work as a dictator. So there's some positives and negatives, but the positive is that I make decisions quickly and seven out of the 10 decisions I make are good. The remaining three are bad. Uh, at other organizations where it's deeply democratic, they only make, in the time I make 10 decisions, they make one decision and it's usually the wrong one, uh, right? And it's, it's, it always comes back to that because we can see that now where a lot of companies are just struggling to just make any decisions. They're sitting and waiting and, and it's the wrong thing to do right now. Right. And I think uh, that goes back to this kind of like new way of working. Um, distributed teams rely on a lot of uh, interconnectedness, interpersonal skills, uh, trust systems. And um, without those being in place before going into this kind of uh, new, you know, video conferencing means of interacting, um, you're seeing that you're seeing an inability to, I think, uh, move forward to work together. Uh, and the wait and see is permeating uh, corporate culture. Uh, you know, people want to be comfortable at their desk before they can think clearly or something. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's really interesting. And I think it's something that um, I've been kind of mentoring a few early stage companies through this period, trying to remind them of the fact that their agility is reliant on, not needing physical infrastructure uh, and proximity to continue working. And uh, if mental space is afforded by, you know, isolation or can be uh, assuming everyone is having healthy lives and still getting out and walking and, and getting fresh air, um, innovation could actually be uh, accelerated through this period. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, even for our business, it's, uh, we're not sitting around. I mean, um, we we have been lucky in the sense that our business has always been um i mean our, our work is completely online we study people online everything we do is online um we do you know we do miss seeing each other's faces from time to time but we've been lucky in the sense that it's not been a big cultural change for us as an organization um but we are seeing you know our clients a struggle right now with the, both the distraction and the fear for making any decisions. And uh, our job really has become, uh, especially in the last couple of weeks, to push people a little bit uh, out of their comfort zone so that they can, um, so that they can start to make some calls, make some decisions, right? doesn't matter if they're wrong, just make some decisions. Just don't hold back because otherwise you're going to have, 
there's always somebody who will eat your lunch, right? <laughs> that's, that's the world we live in. If we don't, if we don't go grab it, somebody else is going to eat it. So do you find that, or have you found that on a sales cycle perspective, uh, though people are a little hesitant to make decisions right now, perhaps existing customers about new campaigns and acting on data when they feel like there's uncertainty. Uh, have you seen new customers come to you uh, looking for the power of data to drive their decisions? Um, yeah, I mean, it, I mean, again, I, it's so far so good. I feel super fortunate, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, a lot of people that we had spoken to in the past that, you know, don't ha necessarily have a ingrained digital mindset uh, have now come to us and said, okay, you know, maybe you were right. Maybe we should have been working with you. So it's, it's definitely brought some people that have been a lot more traditional in, in their research outlook, but now they can't do their focus groups and they can't be out and about uh, doing their shop along. So they're, uh, they're coming to us. Uh, so it's, it's definitely brought some, some people, uh, but the people who have really benefited have been the companies, the clients of ours that already had a very strong digital practice. And I, and I say digital practice in the sense that, you know, they didn't look at online research as online research. They just looked at it as research. Right. Uh, and those companies are the ones that are really benefiting right now because uh, their senior leadership already is attuned to thinking this way. And so they're not having to educate them in this time to say, hey, here's this new way to look at the world. Those are the ones that are really benefiting. But, but again, I mean, um, we're definitely fortunate that we're in a position where it's, uh, it's actually bringing some new customers to the fold and uh, creating greater awareness for uh, the value of, of uh, yeah, internet mediated research. Uh, is there anything, you know, through this period or otherwise looking forward through the remainder of 2020 for motive base, uh, is anything changing to do with how you're approaching um, relating value to customers, your product base, uh, your offering in general? Yeah, um, uh, we are actually right in the throes of a massive innovation cycle right now. Just uh, uh, one thing that uh, we are predicting for our own business and for our industry is a much greater uh, openness and awareness uh, for uh, interacting with uh, you know, research outcomes um, just digitally. Um, you know, the traditional uh, narrative has been, even though you're doing research digitally, deliver it to me over a phone call, come visit me, you know, let's do the song and dance, let's present in front of 20 people in the room. Um, we think that there's going to be a shift in that uh, with the realization that it's not necessary. And then the second um, openness for clients to actually interact with our reports um, online, engage with us online. Um, and so we're going through a, a big innovation cycle right now to bring uh, more of the delivery process uh, the research process is anyway online for us, but to bring more of the delivery process, the client touch points, a lot of that to also bring that online uh, to enable um, more of that seamlessly and uh, to, to use the flow language to enable greater flow um, while the you know, client is in our technology leveraging it and, and so on. So yeah, it, it's definitely changing some of the investments. I mean, it was, this was something that was already part of our pipeline. We just accelerated it just um, given what's going on. Yeah, no, it makes sense, especially as things, I would assume internationally, um, you know, people are reacting to this situation, experiencing it um, yeah. all over the world in the same way. Uh, your, hopefully your client base will increasingly become more global and you'll find people yeah. around the world to, to work with who uh, won't be able to jump on airplanes for a little while still anyway. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And uh, as somebody with a two and a half year old, that definitely makes me happy because I have to say like not, not traveling a, my health is in better shape than I, it's ever been just walking, doing, finding time for yoga, all of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then just not eating out. It's, it's amazing what an impact <laughs> it has, but um, but yeah, but I'm, I'm still enjoying my uh, collective arts, uh, beer though. <laughs> it's been fun hanging out with, uh, with the kid, eh? Yeah. It's been amazing. It's been I've been amazing. spending more time with Ava. She's like just turned two and yeah. she's running around like crazy and talking so much. And 
yeah. just having so much interaction time has been a, a blessing for sure. Yeah, it's definitely the best. Uh, I feel like it's the best age where they say the most hilarious things. And yeah, 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 yeah. This morning, uh, my, my daughter said, perhaps I will have oatmeal. And I was like, perhaps. Impressive. You're like, you fancy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, she may have heard uh, one of us speak that way at some point. That's like, awesome. The sponges. Nice, man. Well, it's good anyway. to hear that you guys are, are doing well and you're still kind of doing yeah. stuff and, and, and observing some interesting, uh, interesting trends along the way. Uh, what's the picture for the next little while in terms of content publishing? Are you going to be rolling out some, some insights regularly for people uh, who are not customers to, to stay tuned to? Yeah, yeah, we're, <clears throat> we're doing, I mean, we've done now three webinar series and we're going to keep doing that uh, month over month. We're going to keep updating that. Uh, the response has been phenomenal. Uh, like uh, the last round, it was so overbooked that um, we didn't even realize, you know, our webinar service kicks out people after a hundred attendees. So it's been, it's been a lot. So, you know, we've had um, very positive response and, um, we're going to try to keep doing that at least for the short term. Um, Cause I think, I think for us as anthropologists, at least it feels like at least from the feedback we've been getting, it's a lot of the stuff where we've been talking about people have been, people have used the word. It's very refreshing to see your uh, insights because it's not about toilet paper and canned food. And so <clears throat> I think that's our goal to try and, look to the future and, and look through the lens of you know, new knowledge creation, what that does to people's behavior rather than just worry about, you know, um, what yeah, people, immediacy. people are behaving now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Nice. Well, we'll, uh, we'll put some of those webinar links, uh, into this post that I'll kind of put awesome. together, um, try and pass people to it. And also I'll introduce you if it helps to, um, our friends at event Moby. Do you know that company? They're a local company. No, they, uh, they've kind of for a long time had like an event ticketing and then event scheduling uh, mm. suite of software for physical events. And they've taken this right. time to accelerate development on their um, digital event platform. Uh, so prime for, for webinars and stuff like that. And I'm sure they'll come you on, uh, on, on the platform or at least give you access to take a look at it and see if it would work for you guys in right. the future. Cool. Yeah. I, I would love to take a look at that. Awesome. Yeah, man. Uh, let's, let's be in touch. And uh, I hope, um, you know, this lands you in a really innovative space. I'm, I'm sure it will. I mean, knowing you and your history, I'm sure it will one way or another, but, uh, but yeah, wish you uh, all the best and let's keep in touch. Thanks man. For sure. Hope to see you uh, on campus sometime soon. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Talk to you soon, man. All right. Bye. Wicked.